All right, welcome everyone. Um, the uh, Bioethics Interest Group at uh, Tulane's Master's Program in Bioethics and Medical Humanities and the Patterson Literary Society would like to welcome you all uh, to this uh, talk by Dr. Samuel Shem. Um, I would like to give you a brief uh, discussion of who we are and who the lecture series is. Um, one of the sponsors is the master's program bioethics and medical humanities and if anybody is interested in things like bioethics or medical humanities take a look at us on the web tulane.edu slash bioethics you can search for us youtube instagram twitter uh tulane bioethics search will catch uh will we'll catch all of our accounts tulane humanities should work we'll get there but we there, there are character limits that are making it not work yet uh but we will get there uh, and you should be able to find us on all of these uh, uh, places. If anybody's interested in actually taking our program, we have information sessions that we have uh, prevented, presented before and they're recorded. Here's a, a connection a QR code. If you're coming back and looking at this later on and it's a recording, you can pause us here and, and check it out uh, at this point. But you can also find those through the tulane.edu slash bioethics uh, link as well. Um, let me tell you very briefly about the program. Uh, and then if you want to know more, you can find out, as I said, on these, we have two tracks, bioethics track and a medical humanities track. And though these things overlap a lot, um, we do want to allow people to focus either more specifically on issues where they might be looking at ethics committees or IRBs, ethics issues, uh, or people who are looking more into the medical humanities, talking about narrative, reflective writing, fine arts, and a history. We um, have a lot of crossover between these two tracks, but definitely we want people to be able to focus on either one of them. Well, what people? Well, we have at least three groups that could be interested in what we're doing. Uh, anyone who's interested in a, a two-year master of science program, whether they're recent college graduates uh, or not yet college graduates, uh, or people coming back after, after a hiatus and you're interested in studying these. We have a standalone master's program. People who are interested in a dual degree with the medical school, we have that as well. It does not add any time to your time to degree. You still graduate with the MD and the MS in four years. And for people who are mid-career, we can work with you so that you can uh, have your own faculty development as a mid-career professional. I don't want to spend any more time talking about us on this particular situation, but I would love to spend lots of time talking about this uh, with anybody that's interested. So please contact me, contact Sophie, um, uh, or look us up on the web. I would also like to um, introduce to you the source of this endowed lecture fund. This is the J. Richard Williams Senior MD lecture series, which was initiated in the fall of 2013. Uh, it honors the legacy of Dr. Uh, J. Richard Williams. University graduate and a well-known and well-loved physician in Selma, Selma, Alabama. After he graduated from Tulane, he completed his residency at Vaughn Memorial Hospital, now uh, Vaughn Smitherman Museum. And he was the primary physician in Selma for many years. His wife, Annie Laurie, remembers he would get up and make night calls and take other responsibilities during World War II. He was very unselfish and giving of himself. And along with serving as Selma's primary physician, Dr. Williams also performed extensive studies in cancer, which were later published in the New England Journal. He loved medicine. He was the kind of doctor who would do anything for his patient. And because of his great dedication to patient service, The lecture series honoring him focuses on the art of creating a compassionate and trusting relationship between patient and doctor, which is why we are very glad to welcome Samuel Shem to discuss with us uh, his work in which, well, some people create compassionate and trusting relationships and others perhaps have a little bit more trouble with that. Um, Shem is a novelist, he's a playwright, he's an activist, his educational bona fides are Harvard Phi Beta Kappa, Oxford Rhodes Scholar, Harvard Medical School with honors, and he's professor of medicine uh, in medical humanities at NYU's Grossman School of Medicine. In 2020, he published his new novel, Man's Fourth Best Hospital, which is the sequel to The House of God, 
about which we'll talk more in a moment, which has sold 3 million copies plus, I don't know, maybe about 50 more in this group. Um, Dr. Sanjay Gupta reviewed Man's uh, Fourth Best Hospital saying, Shem has done it again. It's an instant classic. You may get pissed off, double over in laughter, maybe even cry a little. And says, if you read one medical drama, make it this one. In 2020, The House of God was on the Washington Post list of 12 novels that have changed our lives. Shem was the only living author on this novel. In 2016, Publishers Weekly published a list of 10 best satires. House of God was number two behind Don Quixote and ahead of Catch-22. In 2019, uh, an MD Links vote by doctors of the 10 most influential books at the House of God is number one. In case you were wondering, Harrison's Internal Medicine was number two. The Bible, three. <laughs> That's not bad. Um, he's also written The Spirit of the Place, which is the winner of two American National Book Awards, and Mount Misery, and, the Heart of the, and At the Heart of the Universe. And with Dr. Janet Surrey, has written the award-winning off-Broadway play, Bill W. and Dr. Bob. That's about the founding of Alcoholics Anonymous. They've written We Have to Talk, Healing Dialogues Between Women and Men, and the novel The Buddha's Wife. And in case that wasn't enough, He's also written a classic essay called Fiction as Resistance. With that, I would like to turn things over to Samuel Schell. Uh, thank you. God, that guy sounds like he's an overachiever, doesn't he? I wonder what I've been doing in my life, yeah. <laughs> um, just a technical thing. You're on the full screen and I'm up in a little box on the other. Is that the way you want to have it now? Sorry. You get you get a you're I'm looking at you and then in a little box I'm looking at me and the others. Is this is this what you're intending to do? It's okay. On you our end we, on our end you're captivating the whole center of the screen. Oh, okay. That's fine. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh you know this brings back such memories it, it may uh, I, I did, I think I was two days at Tulane a long time ago, and I was <clears throat> delighted. It was the first Deep South medical school that would dare invite me, the, the uh, writer of the House of God, to. And I had such a good time. I mean, the intelligence, the courtesy, the uh, vision of Tulane was really, really terrific. So I, I just jumped at the idea of uh, appearing again. And I, uh, earlier in the week, as you know, the, the woman who uh, got in touch with me is Kristen Wirth. And uh, lo and behold, her, she, she said, oh, we're a bunch of bibliophiles, bibliophiles. I know people are, now they're watchophiles. Now they just watch things. They don't read things, you know, forgive me. I'm talking about our daughter, you know. Um, and it was a wonderful time to connect with students and uh, 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 you know I uh, I'll jump to the chase a little bit about my journey um, after the house of God came out in 1978 if you can believe it <clears throat> I I had taken a pen name and there was no internet so people couldn't find me and I decided that uh, out of the purity of the writer, a real writer doesn't do appearances, okay? So I said, no, I never said anything about the book in public for two years. And I got on with my life, continued writing, et cetera. And then one day I got a letter through the mail from my publisher and I uh, opened it up and it said, quote, I'm, uh, on call all night in a VA hospital in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And if it weren't for your book, I'd kill myself. And it was like a punch in the gut. You know, it really was. He said, oh, well then, maybe I can help. You know, and that's what we all try to do in this profession. We try to help people, right? And so I, ever since that, that uh, day, that would be 1980, I never really refused uh, an invitation as long as they were uh, uh, not illegitimate or illegal or anything like that. And I've been on, you know, six continents. It's been an incredible ride. And, and uh, you know, I had been told my, by my publisher when um, 
it was uh, just about to be uh, let go, I went down to New York and I asked him, would this, is this book going to sell? And he said, no. <laughs> you know, I just spent, spent three years writing. No. I said, what do you mean? No. Why won't it sell? He says, one, it's sexy and that's good. Two, it's funny and that's good. And three, it's a good book. book good books don't sell. Right? I'll tell you one other story about the birth of the house of God, uh, which is very funny too. Uh, in that same uh, meeting with the, uh, no, I think it was a, a, a different meeting. He calls me up and he says, it's almost ready to be put on the stands, you know? And he says, uh, I want you to come down to New York again to meet with me and the lawyer. Lawyer, I mean, who, who likes that, you know? <laughs> Go down there, there's the lawyer. And they say, we want to be sure that there's nobody identifiable in the novel. And I mean, Jesus, you know, I didn't know you're supposed to disguise people. It's my first novel. Nobody ever said that. Everybody's just about, you know. So I say, okay, well, I'll give them one. So I said, yeah, one. I said, and they said, who's that? And they say, well, it's the chief of medicine. How's he like that as he is in the book? Well, he's uh, a kidney guy and he walks down the corridors uh, with his stethoscope, uh, uh, tucked into his pants and he's the chief of renal and uh, he sings when he goes and sees patients and they said oh no oh, oh this is very bad this is very bad and I can see the thing sinking again and they had a conference and they came back and the the uh, publisher said well does he have a big red birthmark on his face and I say well no he doesn't he says now he does if you Rick pick up your book the house of God first appearance, he's walking down the hall with a stethoscope in the scratch, and I describe a bright red birthmark on his cheek. It's the non-libel convicting birthmark. <laughs> uh, and uh, so I learned how to disguise things a little better. Oh my God, there's a tremendous crash of ice going down the, oh, never mind. Whoa, that, maybe that was his, his revenge, you know. Um, and he hated us, you know, one more story, you know. He hated us, the interns, and he hated us more. Um, uh, when, uh, you know, when he was older and identified by people. And one day, maybe 10 years ago, I opened up the Boston Globe. And there's this big, wonderful, almost half a page obituary of, of, the, of the chief, right? And I'm looking, I'm seeing, and then in the middle, there's quite a big photo. And in the photo, you're looking over, over a patient's shoulder and, watch, and seeing the doctors who are talking around the bed. And, uh, and there he was. And then in a lineup was Hyper Hooper, Eat My Dust to Eddie, two other people who aren't in the book, and me! the last person he would want in his grand obituary. It was unbelievable. All right, enough of these. Let me, let me get on with the more recent things. Um, the, uh, so from the very first time that I started going out there, I've always, always kind of gotten the same topic that I'm talking about today. And it, it's really has two parts. Number one is resistance to injustice. And the resistance in this case was the, um, the way we interns and patients were being treated uh, by, by being forced to be treated by that. And I'll get into it a little more. Um, and the other is uh, the, you know, putting the human back in medicine, basically, and uh, the danger of isolation and the healing power of good connection, connection. Danger of isolation and the healing power of good connection. What's a good connection? A good connection is a mutual connection where both people you know, uh, uh, go away from it feeling better, et cetera. Um, it's, a, it's a mutual connection 
And if it ain't mutual, it ain't that good. If you think of the relationships of all kinds that you've had in your lives. And I'm going to really talk about shifting to the we as a way of being connected and how that is that how connection makes good doctors. So um, when it came out, uh, I thought everybody was going to love it. And I was I had a, a kind of a difficult uh, awakening because the older generation didn't and did some pretty bad things at Harvard Medical School to me. I was on the faculty then. Uh, but my my guys, it was almost all guys in those time, we own, times. We only had one out of 16 um, women in our internship class. But uh, my guys loved it. And uh, it, after a while, it got to be safe for me to say who I was. You know, when I wouldn't know sometimes who was in the in the crowd that I was talking to. So one night, when our daughter was young, it's not even that long ago. Um, Janet and I uh, went to a potluck supper, just parents, and I'm wandering around. I'm kind of shy, and I'm trying to look and see where who can I talk to here. And I'm, I, I walk up to these two women and they I'm listen a little bit and they, I hear, they're doctors. Oh, great. I get a little closer. They're at the Beth Israel Hospital, my alma mater, the house of God, right? And I sit down and I wait for a kind of little gap in the, in the conversation. And uh, I say, well, you know, I may not be the most uh, favorite uh, doctor at the Beth Israel Hospital. And there's this silence and then, then one of them goes, well, you can't be as bad as that guy who wrote that book. <laughs> and then there was this delicious moment. Do I tell her or don't I? Well, of course I told her. And she blushed, beat red. And that was the last uh, play date our daughter had with her daughter. But over the years, you know, this, this radical book that half the medical uh, uh, people hated and the other half loved, it has prevailed. It has prevailed. It sells more than ever now. And uh, I, I just feel so blessed, actually, in a way that it, that it happened. Um, you know, the other thing I've realized as I've grown older is that our lives are really at the whim of a butterfly's wing. If it goes one way, something happens. Another way, it's something happens. And to understand why I write the justice injustice part, I have to go back a bit. I was uh, I'm, I was a guy of the '60s. I was at Harvard in the in the uh, late '60s, and what we learned at Harvard was uh, that if you uh, and and the country was going crazy with assassinations. You know, I mean, at least we haven't had you know that yet, uh, but. Uh, there were assassinations, there were fires in the street, the whole country went out, you know, on strike, you know, it was really, really, really crazy uh, and uh, awful. And, um, what, and, and for instance, my first year at Harvard Medical School, uh, four students had been shot by the Ohio State National Guard when they were protesting, it was horrible. And then everybody went out. And, pe and people in universities, et cetera, were going on strike. And we, the first, we, the, uh, the first year class of Harvard Medical School were just starting the kidney block. And so we had to have, we commandeered uh, an amphitheater and we had a debate and people would get up there and say, you know, if we go out on strike, we'll never learn the kidney. And guys like me said, the hell with the kidney, we're gone. You know we're gone, and what the the thing I'm you know and and also back to Oxford, I may have actually stayed in England as a resistor at that time, but uh, I got a I got a um, a call from my draft board at home saying report for you know the induction. I'd fin finishing my PhD there. And I said, oh, no, no, no. So I had this very simple choice between Vietnam or Harvard Med, right? And I said, well, rather than killing people or maybe getting killed, maybe I'll try to save them, you know? 
And so I was just so lucky, so lucky that I could do that. And I decided that I didn't want to um, write for a living because I thought if I wrote for a living in those days, I'd, I'd have to either do TV or, or film or something like that. It's the only way you could make it. And uh, I decided that medicine is so broad, you know, from viruses to countries, it's so broad. I thought, I'm sure I can find something I want to do and I'll find a way to write on the side. And I loved surgery. I would have been a surgeon, but I can't think of any surgeries who wrote long, good fiction or plays. And in my senior year at medical school, I discovered psychiatry. Huh. You learn about people. Uh, you hear great stories. And I won't have to go in till afternoon. And so that's what I did. After House of God, I, I went to train for psychiatry. And, and, uh, and so it went. Um, so what about the House of God? Um, the other thing I realized about the House of God, you know, these things just come to you. You can't think about them. They just boom. I realized it was so brutal. Almost everything in that book is based on something that really happened. And we were resistors, as you can, you can look at the, at the book as a, a, a manual of kind of nonviolent resistance to this uh, thing. Uh, but um, when, when we went in there as uh, young doctors, we were very idealistic. And, um, we didn't really think that we or the patients were being treated right. And you can read, as I said, uh, The House of God is a, is a nonviolent resistant book. Um, but what I realized, it was so bad that for anybody to read it, it had to ride on, uh, on, on comedy. It had to ride on comedy, right? because uh, otherwise nobody could keep going on it. And then I noticed that just as we had stayed alive by being joking about some of this, I put that into the book, you know, and it came because after it was over, the internship, some of the guys were still around. We used to get together and get drunk and, you know, talk about our stories. And I was taping some of it and blah, blah. And the next thing I know, I started writing a book. But here's an example that, that, that actually, happened at the beginning of the year in the house of God that, you know, made it easy for the humor to come through when I went to write it. Uh, we were at a, uh, you know, at a meal, a late night meal. Another intern, the runt, was having a hard time. As he sat down to lunch, he took out a pill box, put a pill on his hamburger and munched it down. When I asked what it was, he said, Valium, vitamin B. I've never been so nervous in my life. I'm putting all of my patients on Valium too. What, I said, you're putting all your patients on Valium too? Why not, he said. They're all very nervous having me as their doctor. <laughs> you know? So the book starts, it, it sort of rides on, it, it rides on uh, humor. And then it starts to go down and down and down. And a lot of people have to put it down when it comes to a suicide, the suicide and all of that stuff, when everybody breaks up. Okay, so let me, what, what was so bad about the house of God? It took me a long time to figure it out. We were very um, idealistic people coming out of the 60s. As I said, you know, we, we uh, put the, uh, we stopped the Vietnam War and we put the Voting Rights Acts on the, on the, on the books. And, um, you can look at the house of God for that kind of resistance thing. We're, it's a big hierarchical system, right? Where everybody, the top people have, have, uh, put pressure on the, on the ones lower down. And, and what happened to us is we got isolated. Not only did we get isolated from each other, 
each of us got isolated from our authentic experience of the system itself, meaning you start to think I'm crazy for thinking this is crazy. And that's a very bad place to be, as you know. And then finally, and this is luckily, you know, the young ones now here on the screen, um, you don't have the, la the last isolation that we did, which we were almost totally isolated from our loved ones. We didn't see them that whole year for any quality time. So that's been, and in fact, the house of God, I think has, has uh, helped in that Libby Zion, did help in that Libby Zion case. And as, as uh, Chuck, the African-American intern, says it says at the end he he or i writing for him said man how can we care for patients if nobody cares for us how can we care for patients if nobody cares for us and now especially in the in the uh, corporatation corporate corp, corporate uh, feel and, and and takeovers in medicine this is worse than ever this is worse than ever. And doctors are, we can come, we can talk to them. Doctors are letting go of their power because they they don't take action together like nurses do, right? So um, let me talk about um, connection. I'm gonna give you a brief uh, new way of looking at, uh, at connection and power and all of that, that I and uh, my uh, wife, Janet Surrey, who was a model for, Jer uh, for Barry in the book, we worked, we worked together on a new uh, relational model of healthy, of psychological health and growth, okay? So hang on for a few minutes. The usual, uh, the, the standard, Psychology, psychology in America and most other countries is of I. I did this I did, of self, of self. That's how you measure it. That's been going on for, for, for centuries. What these women, and I was the only man who joined them, uh, decided that that didn't really fit, fit their experience. They, they, they were, they, it didn't talk about empathy. It didn't talk about caring for self and others, caring for others, the we, etc. And so the, the, um, the, this, so they designed what's called a relational psychology of psychology and growth. And um, I'll give you an example of what I mean. Say you're on call at, a, at your hospital and um, it's a morning and in, in the afternoon, you have to do something that's really hard, really hard. You don't want to do it. You have to do it. We've all been in that space. It's, it's really awful. You're not confident. You really are sort of power. You don't know what to do, but you have to do it. But you've, you've scheduled a lunch uh, with an old friend you haven't seen for a while. So, this is called the five, here's my, the five good things, right? The five good things. If the luncheon is successful and you make a good connection, you both leave, both of you mutually leave with it, feeling five good things. Number one, more energy or zest, both of you. Number two, more understanding of the other person and of yourself. Number three, more valuing the other person and yourself, right? Then here's the big one. Here's the big one. More empowered to take action, both of you. And then the final one is, hey, let's have, it, let's have lunch again, right? Of course, very simple. Um, let's go toward power, because that's what this is about. That's what this is about. That's what the whole talk I'm giving kind of is about. Um, in terms of of, uh, of connection, isolation and connection, you know, uh, power is often isolated. the The usual, the usual uh, uh, self note uh, kind of power is, you know, Henry Kissinger or somebody is is a powerful person. That it's all in here, right? But in the power that arose in 
the luncheon, neither of these people felt very powerful, but it was in the connecting, the power arose, right? In the connecting, you, a gerund is the only way to describe this, where you, you see the other person clearly, you see her or him seeing you clearly, et cetera, this, it's this thing. The we, all of a sudden you're in a strong we. And you go back to your job, this tough thing, and you do it. You have the power to do it, right? Just try to remember that. You're not alone. I mean, connection is good medicine. It's as simple as that. For instance, there are two new laws uh, in a man's fourth best hospital. I think I put them there. I mean, yeah, there. Um, one of them is, this is for doctors, connection comes first. If you're seeing a new patient and you don't connect, you're not gonna hear the story, right? If you do connect, you're gonna hear it all and it will stay so the next time you'll hear even more, right? Now, you say, well, I can't do that all the time. Well, nobody does it all the time. If you think of regular relationships, not with patients, um, nobody gets a relationship right all the time. You're always screwing it up, right? You're going along, going along and then boom, something happens and you're fighting. The people who survive are the ones who can hold the we that there is this maybe 20 year marriage we, the whole, hold the we for both of the people and even saying, and move on to a bit, and, and even saying, if they're disconnected, we're in a disconnect. We're in a disconnect is a connecting uh, moment, right? And so the one thing I would say about uh, how to, what this means for medicine is just try using the word we. Let me give you an example with surgeons. They did studies to, uh, well, the patriarchal surgeons from the old days uh, maybe would say, I've done the tests, I'm gonna do the surgery. And the patient you know, usually would take it. This is a long time ago. Now we've got, the, the, the surgeon may say, I've done the tests and I, and you can, and I, and, and I would operate on you, but you should, can get a second opinion, right? What if, the, what if the surgeon said, well, we've done the tests, let's talk about what we're gonna do. We've done the test, let us talk about what we're gonna do. He's not giving away power, but if you, if, if, he, if you say that, what does the patient say? She says, he or she says, well, I think, I think we could do blah, blah, blah. If you plant the we in between you and the patient when you're with them, the patient will start using that language and the language concretizes the fact there's a relationship here. They're not alone like Chuck said, right? And what's the number one reason that surgeons get sued? They did a study. Person says, I had no relationship with them. You know, simple as that. So connection is good medicine. Just try to remember that part and use the we. Now, you, you can just go away now. That's all I got. <laughs> uh, okay, I got to tell you what happened to uh, me you know, probably what now? Well, now actually it's seven years ago, you know, this butterfly's wing. I was happy. I was happily writing. Uh, if you want my, if you want to read my best book, read, write it down because nobody wanted to publish it because it's not like the house of God. It's the spirit of the place, the spirit of the place, as you heard it won some more awards and stuff, but it's really, it's about a doctor going back home uh, to a small town and joining his, uh, his mentor, an old doctor who's on his way out. It, anyway, you won't, you'll love it. Um, but I was happily writing and stuff. And, and then out of the blue, pretty much, pretty much out of the blue, the phone rings. And it, uh, it says, he says, I'm from uh, NYU Medical School, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Uh, uh, we want you to uh, come teach at NYU Medical School. Uh, I said, well, what do you want me to teach? I said, well, we want you to teach the house of God. I'm thinking, what? And he said, yeah, we have a humanities section 
and uh, we want you to teach a seminar to everybody who wants to come in the house of God. And you have to understand, maybe you've forgotten, Harvard hated me for this book. All of a sudden, somebody wants me to teach it. It's like I died and gone to heaven. You know, it's unbelievable. And so I say yes to most things, and I went and did it. Little did I know. This is the thing. This is a wonderful thing about life. Little did I know. I got there, and I'm curious. So I'm going on wards. I'm staying up all night at Bellevue uh, Hospital to see what the emergency room's like, you know. The first day I was on the wards, um, I saw all I had I had never I had been out of medicine basically and all of a sudden with a fresh eye I saw number one the miracles that are going on which are plenty like look at COVID what we're doing but big but there was one of these hey wait a second moment this is unjust I saw as as the Roy Bash the same narrator as uh, the house of God is narrating this and at the beginning he says i'm writing about a time when medicine could go one of two ways either toward more humane care or toward less or toward and then and, and and actually what he says is what i saw he says or toward money and screens meaning the, the electronic medical work, which is uh, money and money because as we know but the general public doesn't know we're staring into these screens with our back to them because we're, at, we're, doing their billing. we're doing billing for the hospital and fighting against the insurance company. So all, all of a sudden I said, hey, wait a second, this is even a bigger injustice than just the internship. This is about the system. It's about the system. I got to write about the system. And I, you know, I learned everything I could. NYU is a terrific place. I don't it's the best place I've ever been, frankly. It's not about that. It's from another hospital. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I got to work and uh, it was pretty fast and it came out uh, in, uh, you know, about a year ago or so, uh, Man's Fourth Best Hospital. And, and I'll, I'll read a couple of things. And then are we, do, are we having questions through this, th this, this thing at the end or is it just talking? Anybody know? Whatever makes you happy, we'd love to. We'd love to, okay. to have you talk. We'd love to hear to be able to ask questions. Not bored yet. <laughs> All right. Uh, yeah, I'll leave some time for questions. I like that. So I'm, I'll move on to this. Um, okay. So the so I had this is what I did. This didn't this didn't happen, except in this, this sick head, you know. Um, Man's fourth best hospital used to be man's first hospital. And it's a WASP hospital. And they got really, really scared when it went from one to four. And uh, they had to do something to get back, and they're losing money. They had to get, some, get uh, they had to get somebody who could bring in prestige and money. And the fat man has been doing, uh, uh, has been in, has been in Silicon Valley doing research on pills that would help Gomers to remember. So he was rich and famous. And so he says, yes, I'll do it as long as I have free reign. And uh, they say, what do you want to do? And he says, I want to, to make, I want to have a public outpatient clinic leaning up against your big hospital buildings and I want to have free reign to uh, do uh, a clinic that you know takes everybody. And uh, and they say, what do you want to really do? And he said, I want to put the human back into medicine. It's a, he wants to show how you can put the human back into medicine because he's been he's been very concerned about that. So let me just uh, read a couple of things and then we'll do questions. Um, why am I here, Fat said. He has them gathered around. He has Roy, Eat My Dust Eddie, Hyper Hooper, Chuck, et cetera, the gang. And I'm very proud of this. By the end of the book, there's parity with women. He brings in women. I got a lot of criticism, and even now, that you know there aren't all that many women doctors in the book. 
you know, who are good. Well, that, that's the way it was. You know, I didn't invent that. We had one out of 16 women, you know. Anyway, that's a whole, and it was women's liberation time, you know, the whole different thing. Anyway, so one day I asked to myself, self of fats, what else can you do for medicine? And he said, a lot. Medicine has gotten a lean and hungry look, and it's up to you and your guys, fats, to fatten it up. Why did I recruit you? He wrote in, wrote in chalk on uh, uh, talking. To put the human back in healthcare, we do it together. That sums up who we are, humane docs. And this, again, he writes, money kills care, screens make money, screens kill care. Okay. So I chose each of you because you've still got that fire inside. In the house of God, we resisted, brought them seeming, screaming to the wall of fire that is truth and held their eyes open with red hot toothpicks, making them see our agony, the agony of absurdity, right? Nods around the table. I felt that fire again, saw fire in those eyes, that hope. But man said, Chug, we didn't chose, choose, change nothing. I know Fat said, but from the inhuman, we learned about being human, right? The seeds were there. Remember the, my slogan to you back then? Nobody remembered his slogan. Thanks a lot, geez. He seems to deflate, then inflate again. I kept saying we had to learn to be with the patients, remember? Make them, and, and this was a line from the house, make them feel they're still part of life, part of some grand nutty scheme instead of alone with their diseases. So, um, he says, um, this time we've got leverage. I've got them over a barrel six ways from Sunday and they only know about three of them. Long as we stick together, we got a chance to create something that'll shine. The one thing we got to do, stick together, no matter what. Um, and then uh, he goes on. So to get me here, they gave me everything, total artistic control. Um, a no cut year long contract. And we've got a secret weapon, the pa patient satisfaction score. The higher the score, the higher the pay. Man's fourth bet sat, bat, pat sats are in the toilet. Ours are gonna be in the clouds. He sighed then smiled. We're gonna show them how to be good docs. And that was my, I, I mean, it was a big challenge. But that's what I worked on for years, a few years. Okay. Um, and the more I found out about what's going on in medicine now, the more appalled I was, like about the medical record and the and the training for it. This is briefly, I'll bri briefly, this is true. This uh, this training to deal with their uh, electronic medical re record, which is called HEAL, H-E-A-L. Folks, said the instructor, we are at war against the health industry companies. Like all wars, this is about money. On our side of the screen, we're fighting for the highest payment for our work. On their side of the screen, they're fighting for the lowest payment of our work. In principle, we could max out cash by clicking on little boxes in two ways. One is qualitative, the worst diagnosis in severe form, the other is quantitative. Health insurance, the army on the other side of the screen, tried to minimize our maximums of money. Bad news, said Bob, and they have lawyers. The good news, we have 334 people in the billing building, which is true. The billables, also the name of their a cappella group, by the way. Uh, in real time, they track your choices on your screen to max out money. We nicknamed our elite billing enforcer team coders for cash. Surgical procedures make the most money. Medical care makes the least. He paused. Then he said fiercely, except for the diagnosis of sepsis, severe. After you click sepsis, the pop-ups ask mild, min minimum, medium, or hot, like at a Thai restaurant. But sepsis is by definition a life-threatening blood infection, always severe. Monetized compared to mild or medium, severe is a cash cow. And then he finishes by, this is true, he finishes by saying, 
it all boils down to e earwax. He, stalk, he spoke passionately about how to squeeze the most money out of earwax. How many of you routinely earwax your patients? We didn't reply. The money in earwax flows by clicking this diagnosis in almost all patients and removing as much volume as you could. He then showed us you have to choose between two codes for earwax removal. 40773 is for just taking a syringe, syringe and washing it out for $77. Uh, using the metal scooper thingy, uh, the metal scooper thingy to remove it, $182. Guess which procedure for full extraction and max liquidity is preferable? Both. Do the right thing. The right thing for all of us in the fat man clinic was to walk out. I was with Chuck and Naidu walking down the hallway. So Chuck, I said, what'd you think of that? Man, it all went in one ear and out the other, you know how it is. <laughs> That's all true. And those of you who are on the, on the front lines in hospitals, you know, this is horrible. I mean, how did we let people get to do this? You know, I mean, when I talk, I'll, I'll, when I'm asked about this kind of, I say, you know, what to do, I can talk a little more about that, what to do. I said, well, here's an example. You remember when you used to be able to go to a theater and somebody would, would fall down on stage, you know, like he's dying or something, would a shout go up, is there an insurance executive in the house? No, no, we're the doctors. We do the work. Without us, they couldn't last two days. You know, if 10% of doctors struck for two days, we'd have a new healthcare system. Anyway, lastly, um, at the end, uh, you know, so the book is all about how he tries to do this. In the middle of the book, he gives a talk, the fat man, the six rackets of American healthcare follow the money. And for me to, you know, I feel, I feel a real um, dedication to get this right if I'm going to write about it. So I spent two months looking at what all the different uh, net, uh, parts of healthcare are now. And it's, it's unbelievable, it's almost impossible to understand. And then in the end, he suggests what to do. Um, but uh, this is um, uh, just, to, just to end, uh, this is an example of what me the medical uh, visit to the doctor has said, you know, ha has become. Your visit to your doctor has become satire. You walk in, lucky if you get eye contact, and sit across the desk. Your doctor is trapped, hunched behind a computer screen, back or shoulder to you. The doc asks a question. You answer. The keyboard goes click, 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 faster and faster. On and on it goes, and you find yourself in the patient's dilemma. Do I keep talking or wait for a break in the action? Usually the next question. Is he or she still listening or not? The new definition of a good doctor, one who can contort his or her body to touch type while still making eye contact. As you keep waiting, two questions may enter your mind. What is he or she doing? What you don't know is that your doctor is sitting there in front of that screen seething because he is forced to sit in front of a screen seething instead of what he wants to do to talk and listen and be your doctor. He spends 60% of every workday, at least six hours, in front of that screen, more time than with patients. This is the doctor's dilemma. Why is he or she doing this? You might think he's doing this, she's doing this because it will be better for your health care. It may not. It may be worse. Worse for your care and, for sure, worse for the care of your doctor. It's better only for the money, the health care industry to make as much money as possible. We doctors are caught in this mess. We're not treating the patient, we're treating the screen. And it's not that your doc doctor wants to turn his or her back on you. It's the healthcare industry that has turned its back on both you and your doctor. And, you know, so be it. Um, let me just end with, and I've got some suggestions about what we could do. The fat man at the end 
when he sums up what he thinks they should do, really the thing that could change everything, he says, we've got to squeeze the money out of the machines. We have to squeeze the money out of the machines. And basically going back to what Obama wanted the machines for was data, you know, compiling data and sending data, right? And what happened was the insurance company got their fingers into it and every piece of data has a mo money, a monetary value, right? Except for the VA. That's why the VA is, has such a good system and doctors are, are happier. Let me just say something about re, what I've thought about, um, about suffering, if you don't mind. Doctors never use the word suffering. I mean, I'm, I'm asking you to remember one word, the we, use it. But uh, you, you rarely hear suffering as a word in medicine. And at the end of another book, the, the spirit of the place, the character sort of comes up with this. He's a doctor. And he says, that, you know, suffering is, is not optional. Everybody suffers. People suffer big suffer, suffering, little suffering. All of us suffer. The issue isn't the suffering. It's how we walk through it. If we try, like a lot of men do, especially, to cut, gut it out and walk through it alone, we are going to uh, spread more suffering around and suffer more. If, on the other hand, we walk through suffering with others, with, as doctors, as doctors, that's our job to be at to be with patients at the worst times of their life. If we can help them uh, move through that suffering with us and other people, we will all not, uh, we'll all not uh, suffer as much and we won't spread as much suffering around. So we have a little time. I'm too wordy again, but um, go for it. Maybe I'll just read the questions here and, and we'll get to as many of them as we can. Okay. Um, you're speaking about screens. We have, uh, of course, the turn to, or a greater turn to telehealth and telemedicine because of the pandemic. So how do you think healthcare professionals are using their screens to address inequities and bring the human back to medicine? You talk a lot about how that robs them of the human. Is there a way to use the screens to bring some human back? Uh, okay, I didn't quite hear it all. It's a little fuzzy from you, but uh, oh, no. about, about using how useful the screens can be to help in something like a pandemic. And bring the human back into medicine. Yes. Yeah. Well, you know, I think, yes, of course. I think it's been a great example about how we can, uh, we can actually help people with, I would guess I would call it the screen we. You know, there is a we there, especially if it's one-on-one. -on -one. And so I think, you know, short answer, I think, yes, I think for patient care, I've seen it, I've been watching people do it. Um, I, I think it's fine. The issue is actually, even with, even with that, the issue is, are, are the insurance companies kind of, uh, uh, forcing you to do what you don't quite want to do on those screens even there because you're going to be billing them, right? But you still have the billing function. So that's got to be regulated. Yeah, good question. By the way, if I get cut off, you know, at exactly uh, one, maybe you, if you want, you could send some questions along if you, I don't know if you can easily get them and I can write answers to them. I would love doing that. I don't know. Can you take that off the screen and somebody? We'll uh, we'll see what we can do. Certainly. Okay. Good. Or let me just because you know, I'm a pretty open guy now. If you want to get me directly, my uh, personal email is shem at comcast.net. S S H E M at comcast.net. Easy to remember. Then I'll probably answer. Okay. Anything else? Um, question about whether or not changing individual practice will be enough. Um, says, I feel like part of this is bridging the patient dilemma with the doctor dilemma. 
so the public is aware of what is happening. Um, yeah, so, I mean, I think getting this, uh, patients know something is happening that when they go in and their doctor has his or her back to them. I think for bringing that forward, I mean, as I said, you know, we are looking for action now. I, you know, despite how horrific this has been and how healthcare in America has gotten worse and worse, I see lighted, I see this being so bad that that's hope. That's what hope is. That's what hope is when all of the things don't seem to be coming together at all. And I think there are signals that things can be coming together more and more. But this is a hopeful time, and it's up to people younger than me, really, to, to take action. I mean, we do the work. <laughs> you know, We have to ally with nurses. Um, here's an interesting question. Um, what do you think of the movie version of House of God? Uh, I think without question, it's the worst movie ever made. So, and two, number two, um, it will never be seen because they've got it in some vault. You know, I don't even know where it is. So that's good. And that's the best thing about it is that there isn't a movie. Yeah. I, I mean, I, you know, it's out on the thing, but yeah, I could write a whole book about that. It, it's, it's the worst. It's the worst. Um, do you see another, <laughs> perhaps a less painful question. Do you see a uh, better doctor patient relationships if doctors use scribes? Um, well, I, I'm not, I'm, I, I, I don't know. I, I'm not on, I'm not in there with them. I know they're using them. The, the question that I always ask though, I don't quite get an answer. Yes, you're using scribes. Okay, your doctor is looking at you. Yes, he probably has a chance to connect better, which is right, you know, point number one. But what happens with the billing? He's still got a bill. Now the scribe can't quite go to, I don't think the scribe goes and bills because the guy has to inflate the bill or else, you know, that's the question you ask on scribes. I don't know the answer to that one. Um, let me see if I can enjoy it. So there are more nurses than docs and they unionize better. So it's nice to hear someone say we should work with them, but most doctors organizations are constantly also fighting against mid-level expansion of scope. So how can we best work together with nurses and mid-levels to fight for reform and not against each other? Uh, the, the scope of the nurse, was that what you say, said? Um, I mean, yeah, I think so, yeah. Yeah, um, well, it's, yeah, I mean, doctors don't, doctors still, I guess, almost all, mo mostly male, but certainly the culture is still a male culture. They don't, they don't, we don't stick together. We don't make groups. I mean, the gender, the gender difference in, in general, <laughs> is, you know, there, there have always been so many nurses, female nurses, that they, they are very good at working together. They really are. We are trained, basically, the male model, even a lot of women in medicine, are, you know, to get anywhere, especially to rise in the hierarchies. So we're, you know, even our, our women don't, there aren't enough of them, I think, and enough of people who have taken this really, really, really seriously to say, let's get together. Let's get together. We have power when we're together, but we don't have any power. I mean, the worst thing, and this is the new novel I'm working on, is example, um, is, is in this hometown of mine, Hudson, New York, where the spirit of the place is set, this wonderful old hospital from right after the Civil War has just been purchased by a private equity, you know, national system. And that is a huge problem now. That's another huge problem. All over the country, these, uh, these financiers are only trying to get the, the equity out of it. And they're, 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 they're uh, closing smaller hospitals so that the first thing they do and they did it in my city 
where I grew up, the first thing they do is they get rid of obstetrics. Imagine that. So the people in my town where I grew up have to drive, the women who are pregnant, if they want a delivery in a hospital, it's 40 miles. They deliver by the side of the road sometimes. I mean, so this is the new book. Um, we have a question from a rising intern. What advice can you give to newly minted residents on how to best care for ourselves on a daily basis, despite the feelings of disenfranchisement within the healthcare system, um, uh, harbored from witnessing daily injustices? Uh, how do you think residents from different programs can go about starting a union? Okay, uh, starting the union, uh, I think it's, it may well get so awful, you have, we have to, you know. I think trying to start to think about it and all of that stuff is fine. Um, what was the first part of the question? I didn't quite. Um, what advice do you have for newly minted residents on how to best care for themselves? Right, okay. Um, well, I'm gonna be a broken record. Um, and I believe this in my heart and spirit. And that is don't get isolated. You know, I, when I was a psychiatrist, I did, I mean, stick together, uh, connect. When, when, I, uh, when I was a, a, a psychiatrist, I wound up specializing in uh, treating alcoholics and drug addicts, you know, real bad ones. And I heard about AA and I went to meetings to see what it was about. And I was absolutely astonished. Um, and my wife and I got together actually and wrote a play called Bill W. and Dr. Bob, which is about the relationship between the two men that led to the founding of Alcoholics Anonymous. And what they discovered, maybe this is a, an answer to the question, is that uh, the only thing that can keep a drunk sober is telling his story to another drunk, which is really a little bit weird. It may or may not hurt the, help you. So, connection comes first once again and that's a mutual connection that click so if you start to feel like you're getting depressed or you're lonely or you're doing strange things that's the time alcoholic in aa who makes when he's alone on a saturday night say he's got he, he could go out and get a bottle of booze or he can pick up the phone the sponsor everything in here no I, i'm gonna i want this i'm gonna drink but he moves against those forces in you and he makes the call i'm saying in some or other for each of you if you ever get into that place um you have to understand the, the only thing that can help you is to ask ask for help and I think there's great hope in, um, I, I think in some ways this, this now uh, that, that the people who are, are medical students and interns now, I mean, it's not the same, but they know how to, you know, get on a, on a site and actually talk to somebody else. I don't know, but the, just the only thing I don't mean, I'm, I'm keeping it simple. Um, Connection comes first. Just, just, just remember the we. You're, you're not, you're never alone. The other piece, and this is going to seem a little bit strange, but saved my life. You have to have a spiritual practice. What do I mean by a spiritual practice? Like in a, they, you know, they, um, uh, it's. Uh, a spiritual practice is not an ego-centered practice. A spiritual practice is um, an opening to beyond the self. And the first step of that is to be in the relationship. And that can lead to a relationship with God or the Buddha or a teacher or whoever. That's what, that's what gets us through. You know, and I've, I've, I've heard, and I haven't seen personally, but I've heard of these these uh, suicides by medical students and interns and stuff like that, it's, it's getting worse and worse. The issue right now is that everything's getting worse and worse for doctors and you can't isolate, that's the big thing. You know, 
Try using the word we, see how it goes. Um, I, uh, we, are, we are at time and I, I don't want to cut a conversation off, but I do want to, before people have to leave, their lunch break is over or whatever, I want to thank you uh, very much uh, for uh, coming in and speaking with us and, and uh, taking your time to, to share with us. Uh, thank you so very much and thank you to Nikki for setting this up and the bioethics interest group uh, for getting this to happen. Uh, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you too. I've, I've enjoyed it a lot. A lot, even on Zoom. <laughs> even. <laughs> thank you. Take care. Bye bye. Thank you. There was a there was an additional question that someone had about um, what does it uh, uh, under medical undergrads before they hit internship and residency any suggestions for how they um, can keep their togetherness um, and I don't know if that person is still here or or not but uh, in any case uh, just perhaps if question about isolation being as much of a concern even during undergraduate medical training. Isolation for undergrads. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Um, and, and it's, I don't know how it's gonna look for, you know, depression and suicide after we're out of this right. pandemic. Um, but this is, we are only uh, at the tip of our understanding on how people are gonna come out of this now. You know, I mean, I even I even find myself. I mean, I I um, I was doing a promotion for Mansforth Best Hospital in New York the first week in March, right. last not no, the, the, the previous March, and uh, big crowds. You know, we weren't shaking hands. Was the only thing we weren't doing, and. Uh, Came and I and I went to Montefiore up in the Bronx, which was a hellhole, uh, and also down in uh, Brooklyn and uh, SUNY, gave talks and stuff, and came back. and I caught it, and my wife caught it from me up here in Boston. And uh, it's it was very scary. We 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 didn't have to get intubated or anything. we didn't have to go to the hospital. The uh, virus sort of tiptoed over toward our lungs and said, "Nah, we don't want to do that." And went back. Yeah. So we were lucky, uh, but this is a profound in, this is a profound shift now. It really is, and we ain't out of it yet. Uh, it's going to be hard, I think, coming back into real relationships now. I think I don't know. I don't know. It's I I I hate to say this. I I still am a little leery of going out a lot. I I don't go out a lot, you know. Uh, so, but you know, everything I've said is pretty simple it's just hard to do. And I meant that when I said, especially around the age, I think if by the time you're in your mid thirties, maybe 40, if you, if you haven't switched to some kind of relational life, meaning, you know, having some, having someone that you care for and cares for you, maybe a spiritual practice. If you haven't gotten that by then, then I worry. You know, I mean, there's a lot of time to suffer and get, you know, and learn and all of that. But, um, you know, there, the, the, I, I do worry about how people are going to come out of this. Uh, it's, it's a bit weird. And, you know, not, not, and we're not even through, actually, yet. I don't know. Right. I, I feel much the same way. And you know, actually, I also feel maybe you found out that I'm, I'm demented or something, but I'm not. I'm not quite as 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 uh, my brain isn't working as much because it hasn't has as much stimulation. You know, where are my keys? You know? mm -hmm. I think that's sort of par for the course for some of us. Um, and uh, the book, the new novel, is set, you know, in the time of COVID, and in this little hospital. And uh, so I'm once again, it's like, hey, wait a second, you know, somebody's got to write about this. Yeah, I'm looking forward to, to that. <laughs> read, read, read uh, the spirit of the place. That's what you should read. 
next. Well, thank you, everybody. Uh, if anybody else has any questions, I think there's a few of us enough here that you can just pop in. But otherwise, um, I would just like to say thank you very much. I'm so, so very, very uh, uh, glad you were able to, to do this for us. Me too. Thank you so much, Nikki. Yeah, ask me next year, too. <laughs> All right. <laughs> That's a go. That sounds right. good. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.